Excellent. Thanks, Deb. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Mars, and I am Intel's Chief Open Source Compliance Officer. And I'm Alexios Zavras, and uh, I am, um, what am I? Uh, uh, senior Compliance Engineer, something like that. Yeah, but we're both working on the Open Source Program Office and it, Intel. Right. Alexios and I work together, and we are here to talk to you today uh, about some of our adventures in open source at a large company and to share what we hope can be some practical advice that should be usable by organizations of any size. See if I can make my camera work. Oh, dear. Yeah, my know. bandwidth is not great, but yeah. I'm not sure if it adds a lot. Yeah, great. You can see me. Okay, <clears throat> the technology is strong with us today. Okay, so going to talk to you about our adventures in open source. Um, can you go to the next slide? So, um, yeah, we. This is a, a general have. slides. You probably have heard of us, right? Uh, it's Intel is a very large company. It has hundreds of a hundred thousand employees, almost. Uh, all around the world in different locations, different time zones. Uh, yeah, the important thing, I mean, for this audience is that although Intel is known to be a hardware company and producing, you know, uh, chips and uh, CPUs and all things hardware, we also have a very large uh, presence in software, right? Uh, we have over 15,000 employees. Uh, software engineer employees that mainly produce software right. right and they are all all over the world again they're all over the world they're all in different business units and almost all of what they produce uh, contains open source software so that's right. a lot of people and that's a lot of open source software so <laughs> yeah Intel is uh, yeah, very active in open source, as you probably know. Uh, we're a large consumer and producer of uh, open source, uh, mainly because almost, I think, every single software offering, firmware or whatever we are producing contains open source. There's nothing that uh, can be done without it. Uh, but uh, we're also, uh, you know, uh, top or number one contributor in many uh, large open source projects. Right, uh, starting from the Linux kernel and lots of other things. Uh, we mainly, you know, uh, deliver uh, tuning and optimizations for our to for the software to run our hardware better. But yeah, uh, uh, we definitely have a large presence in that. And this, as Jessica said, is across all business units, right? So it's not that we have one specific team inside the company that. Uh, handles open source and everybody else is not touching it. Uh, everybody in every project, uh, they both consume and most likely produce open source. Yeah, and this is actually pretty amazing um, from where things were maybe 20 years ago when Intel first started dabbling with open source software. Um, it was almost kind of a secret cult activity done in the shadows, um, but now it's it's pervasive across the company, which is awesome. Go to the next slide. Ah, our crowded field. So nowadays, unfortunately, we're not special. We're not that unique. Um, it's not unique to be a big company who's using and releasing open source software. And if you've been around for any length of time, if you've gone to conferences, um, you see that there's now entire tracks developed to uh, discussing the subject of how to consume, how to uh, produce, how to be a good open source citizen. Um, but back in the olden days, there really wasn't. Uh, an easy way to find useful guides or, you know, a template, a roadmap for what you should do uh, to, to handle open source software within an organization and how to set up your developers for success, um, let alone how to organize an open source program office. Those things exist today, but they didn't way back when. Um, so there was a lot of trial and error that happened uh, while we navigated the landscape, trying to find our footing. So. Alexios, you realize we switched the slides that we were talking. I was supposed to do slides one through four, and you were going to do five through eight. So now I'm all confused. Um, 
so some of the challenges that we faced, and they're probably familiar to you too, uh, was first getting a handle on the you know, what was going on within the company in terms of usage of open source participation and open source projects, you know, who's doing what and where, and really just finding out who's who. And once we sort of got a feel for where open source activity was happening within the company, um, we made the observation that there was quite a, a lot of variation um, in terms of experience and uh, knowledge and sophistication with regard to understanding uh, of open source, uh, you know, what is it, what does it mean, what does it not mean. Um, and uh, yeah, today it still exists. There's really a, a whole spectrum um, of, uh, or a continuum of open source expertise. Um, and of course, one of the big challenges or probably the biggest challenge for us anyway, was just our size. Um, so even you know, 20 years ago when Joel was first starting out in open source, we were still a pretty big company <laughs> um, and we're even larger today. Um, so any policies that we came up with in order to, um, you know, help developers be successful uh, needed to be things that could scale and run at scale and not require a lot of human glue. So, like I said, these are probably familiar to you, um, but hopefully by sharing some of our answers with you, you can go right to the good part, to the solution space, and not have to go through growing pains. So, are, are you going now, Alexios? Oh, you're on mute. So, uh, sorry, hardware problems, anyway. So, as Jessica said, every organization that handles open source faces the same issues, right? And uh, basically, we all have the same goals, right? The idea is to increase compliance, but, you know, decrease bureaucracy and essentially make it easy for our developers to produce the product, right? It's not good for us to be a stumbling block uh, on every process that they are doing. And yeah, we're not getting very popular doing that. So, and another goal is uh, forget the uh, uh, confines of the single organization or our company. We want to be good open source citizens for the whole uh, community. So the solution that you've probably heard and everybody's uh, doing these days is you have to establish a formal open source program office, the OSPO. Right? And the, the benefits of doing that is that you uh, consolidate the knowledge of open source uh, to one specific team that the whole organization can refer to and they can uh, help everyone and uh, uh, share their expertise with everybody else right and but uh, uh, and then the OSPO one of the things uh, one of the main tasks is to you know uh, explain things and do outreach internally in the organization and uh, help promote on the source and uh, uh, make the whole organization uh, level up in uh, uh, participation in uh, open source way right and the other the external facing activities of an ospo would be to participate in initiatives and events uh, like uh, this one today or uh, uh, more uh, industry initiatives uh, that are happening you know uh, spdx and open chain and the to do group and uh, lots of other things where again everybody's facing the same issues right and none of the organization thinks that the way to solve it is a competitive advantage so fortunately we're all working together in, in a very open way and exchanging information and exchanging knowledge so that we can all get better uh, in what we're doing oh just one thing i wanted to to note or in case it's not clear when we talk about establishing a formal open source office i'm wondering if there are some people who are listening and going oh my god we don't have the bandwidth or the resources to have this whole separate you know unit and that's actually not um what we're saying i think the ospo is more a state of mind um certainly in in intel's case and we'll talk more about this later um but it's it's 
very much a, a loose federation of people who are passionate about the subject. Um, and so we're not saying that you have to, you know, get specific headcount um, dedicated to to doing this. It's really more uh, you need to establish a way for like-minded people or willing agents of change to be able to come together and share ideas. So actually giving more details of exactly this thing is uh, we have the OSPO as not in, uh, uh, you know, established as a separate business unit or organization or whatever, right. Uh, and we have people participating uh, definitely from engineering, but also from the legal department, from uh, our security experts and stuff like that. But the whole organization is virtual, right. So members are distributed all around the world and they uh, belong into different you know, organizational units. But they're interested in uh, what uh, open source uh, program office is doing. So, you know, the whole open source uh, activities. Uh, so they want to participate. Right? And as I mentioned before, for general OSPO things, we do things uh, internal and external, internal facing uh, that we explain, we provide expertise to everyone uh, inside the company and we evangelize the wonderful words of everything open and uh, we educate people and we will hear more about that later and, uh, and externally we participate you know in uh, initiatives uh, across our organization as company right and our OSPO is you know uh, continuously improving because we have not found the exact perfect way to run it uh, until now and we're constantly improving uh, both our processes and our structures. Our main internal uh, uh, processes or you know, our, our internal tasks are based on three components, right? Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, you, just, three, yeah, three key components in our strategy. So um, remember a few slides back, a few slides back, we talked about sort of when we were in the storming and forming phase and doing the, the situational assessment, you know, understanding who is doing, who is active in open source and what exactly did that mean um, across the company. And we observed that there was this spectrum of uh, knowledge um, and, and experience. So um, it occurred to us that, you know, it would probably be pretty good to have uh, a baseline uh, against which developers could measure themselves or, you know, that all developers would be expected to reach. And the way to do that is through training. Um, so we implemented mandatory training for software developers um, on a number of subjects, but the one that we're here to talk about today is about open source. Um, so they get training in open source licensing basics, you know, what are the different kinds of licenses, how they work, the philosophies behind open source, the history of open source. Um, very important since these are developers who are going to be distributing software, uh, understanding the different license obligations that are associated with each license type and best known methods for fulfilling them. Um, sometimes people get frustrated, they're like, what, what's the one right way to do something? It's like, oh, well, there's many different ways. You really need to understand sort of the spirit behind or what the motivation behind the obligation is. And then you can figure out you know, a way that works uh, for your particular use case to satisfy it. Um, and also giving them some education about identifying potential license con licensing conflicts. And that, that sort of dovetails into some of the other IP related topics that developers are required to uh, study. So handling third party IP, uh, protecting Intel's own IP, um, you know, certainly understanding what happens if you if you mix proprietary code with uh, uh, reciprocal code, uh, that that might be something you want to avoid, and then a specific training on on Intel's internal processes related to all of the above. So education, key number one, and um, I really think ongoing education is important. Okay, the second part or the second important piece in our strategy is to plan. It's to plan for how you're going to use uh, IP. Plan how you're going to use code that you didn't use yourself. And uh, the best thing we think is to, to know early on what you're doing. Keep track of what you're using if you are using software that you didn't write yourself. So the development teams are trained to document 
you know, what it is that they're using, where they got it from, and what license it's under before they start incorporating it into any of their projects. And in fact, um, that will get reviewed at multiple places, but the idea here is that we want to avoid surprises. Surprises at the end of the development process are expensive. Um, and then the third and final component of our process, and I actually think this is the one that's our most special, is this required the idea of a required peer review by a panel of experts. Um, and this is where people, project teams, bring their proposals uh, to have this panel uh, look at the architecture, the proposed architecture, um, to review the the documented uh, IP that they want to be using to you know explain or to to make sure that there aren't any licensing conflicts or issues or to make sure that what their proposed plan is is going to be uh, acceptable to the community and then uh, provide advice on community etiquette and interaction uh, again providing feedback on the likely community reaction to a particular action or, or strategy that's being proposed uh, sometimes we do have to pull people back uh, and explain why what they you know, our, our proposing is, is not going to go over well. But um, those are the three the three key things, the education, the planning, and the panel of experts. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, not everything is, you know, as we described, very simple and yes. So it's not that you're doing these three things and everything is uh, working perfectly or you uh, somehow, you know, you establish your open source program office uh, with this virtual team of experts and uh, everything then flows uh, wonderfully. So, um, but, but we found the secret, right? So uh, we discovered the secret recipe for running for, you know, running a successful OSPO, right? And as we said, you know, uh, this is not competitive advantage. We want everybody to uh, benefit from this. So let's share it with you. And the wonderful secret is that you should run your OSPO like an open source project, right? So let's... So what does that mean? Yay. So it means that basically, think of your OSPO as an open source project, right? And apply your typical open source software development principles and value systems to uh, your operations, right? So basically, do not think that, you know, everything will be top down, the process will be written once and everything will be uh, uh, run forever wonderfully, right? You want to uh, iterate and release early and often, but then get bug reports. This doesn't work as a process, right? Or what we're doing internally, and uh, uh, and then fix it and release again and find a new version and stuff like that, right? Um, the other part is uh, like an open source community. You have to coordinate across all different. Uh, uh, disciplines uh, inside the organization, right? As I mentioned, we have people from engineering, from legal, we definitely have people from marketing, you know, because they all get involved in, I mean, the, if the, we produce a final product, every part of the company uh, probably contributes to that and is interested in that, right? And all, all the people uh, working in the OSPO uh, can, suggest and provide improvements, right? Again, this is not a top-down, uh, there is the head uh, OSPO person who, uh, you know, dictates how everything should be working, right? It's like an open source project, uh, uh, coding project. Uh, people can submit ideas, uh, uh, we discuss them, some of them get implemented, some of them uh, get rejected, some of them get refined. You take uh, input from everyone, you discuss, and you generate uh, uh, the, the next version, and you keep iterating and uh, producing uh, better versions, right? And as a typical open source uh, project, you also have to think about leadership and governance, right? So the same way in open source uh, development, you have different roles, right? Uh, the same way in OSPO, you have some uh, 
roles. You might have a BDFL, a, a dictator for life, uh, uh, or you have a maintainer, a committer, a contributor, right? Somebody just suggests things and people review it and maybe they are the people who can uh, commit and update the policy and there are people who maintain this and stuff. It's very similar like uh, an open source because that's what we know, so we apply that to everything and it works. So everybody can participate, right, and the members increase their status, but status is just between the team, right, it's not something uh, official, right. But you trust someone because you have seen that he has good ideas, and so you ask him uh, when a new thing comes, right? And uh, uh, we have this internal community, and it really works uh, as a, a typical open source community, right? Uh, so, and the way to get all this diverse set of people uh, that we mentioned before, the virtual team spread around, and uh, uh, all geographic location and stuff, you just, you know, document how people can participate and people who are really interested, you know, the typical open sourcing, if you have a need to scratch, you contribute, right? Uh, they will uh, appear to you and they will basically help you, right? And if you are transparent on how decisions are made, right, uh, then, you know, yeah, everybody is uh, clear and fine with that. Uh, and you get more and more results. So I would disagree slightly that that's more than just documenting everything, um, although that's essential. And, and it's true that there are some people who will be proactive and, and seek out and say, hey, how can I become involved? Um, but I think uh, there needs to be a good amount of outreach within your uh, internal community as well. Um, I know for me, when I observe people who maybe they're just coming through for an approval or something, but I see, you know, an interest or a spark or something, um, I'll usually have a side conversation with them and, you know, probe and see if they'd be interested in uh, in, in getting more involved with the, with the OSPO. And um, I think that's a, a really important thing to do to maintain and grow uh, a deep bench. Again, it's Typical open source, right? <laughs> Even if you create a wonderful project in order to get contributors, you have to advertise yourself and actually collect them. But yeah, it's, yep. yeah. And that's so often forgotten. You know, people are like, oh, I open sourced my code. It's like, what's your community plan? And they're like, what? So we do try to practice what we preach. So to wrap up, um, again, we think these are recommendations that will work for companies of, of any size, and these are things that we sort of grew organically for us over the years. Um, but first and foremost, and you'll probably hear anybody who's talking on the subject tell you this, you really need to have a governance or compliance policy for your organization. If you don't have one yet, get to work. Now, luckily, there are a lot of resources available to you. Uh, you might be able to get a, a ready-made uh, governance or sample compliance policy from, you know, to-do group, um, from FSFE. Many, many resources available today, but you, you do need to, to, uh, to formalize it a little bit. Um, second, think you need to establish an open source program office and run it like an open source project. Again, this is something that happened um, more or less organically. Oh, the part about it running like an open source project, it just seems kind of natural, right? That that's how people involved in OSPO would run things. Um, but it, it seems to be working really well. And uh, that's that's how we plan to keep operating it for forever. Um, as part of the OSPO work, cultivate that internal community um, and make sure that within the company, you're role modeling the best of open source norms and practices, even outside of the scope of um, official OSPO functions. Uh, I think all of the people who are involved um, in, a, in a regular basis in the OSPO role model these in all their interactions uh, with people. Um, you know, they're assuming good intent, they're seeking to educate and uh, bring, lift everyone up. And last but not least, make sure that you take advantage of the many opportunities to participate in external initiatives that develop and promote um, open source best practices. Like Alexio said, you know, we're, all the companies, we're not looking at this as being like a secret strategic advantage that we want to withhold from people. Um, we get better, faster working together and sharing. So that's all I have. And we finished on time. So, are there any questions? 
I see a question in the chat. If you don't, is Intel comfortable letting its employees contribute to open source in their own names, or does Intel require its employees to contribute to the community under Intel's name? Um, the great question, Fran. So we do have a, a policy for own time open source development where the um, uh, the employee will make contributions in their own name. Uh, it's the contribution isn't owned by Intel, but again, it's it's something that's done on their own time, and they do need to. It's a very lightweight process, but they do need to get uh, manager approval to do that. But certainly. If no other questions. Multiple people are typing. Yeah. Oh, they're typing. Yeah. Oh, they're typing. There's lots of typing going on. <laughs> I was going to bust out with a joke. Go ahead. We we're waiting. No, no, they're terrible. They're terrible. Okay, so, so Jess says, can you talk more about how you get support for management and how management supports your activities? Ah, oh, you know, that's actually support at the top is super important. Um, and uh, when you don't have it or when it disappears, it's super painful. Um, and uh, so I, I think the secret is to, so you need, you, the secret, it's not really a secret. So you, you need to, you need to demonstrate to the, uh, to the management, you know, why this thing is important. Um, and probably the things that are going to speak most to them is, you know, reputation for the company. And you know this is what the potential cost could be if we if we screw up uh, or if we don't do this thing right, and then reassure them that what we're going to do isn't going to stand in the way of engineering progress. You know, uh, come up with solutions that are going to be scalable, but also maintainable and uh, not too painful for the developers. And if you're able to show and you know constantly remind them of the fact that like, hey, this is the stuff this is the the penalty or this is this is the bad outcome that we're avoiding and look this is actually how we're introducing very little friction into the development process so you should keep letting it go um i mean that's that's kind of how we've operated um leadership changes of course over the years and sometimes there have been leaders who are more um positive or more uh, more understanding about open source than others. Um, I'm actually really excited about the new person uh, that Intel hired a couple months ago named Greg Lavender, uh, who is now going to be leading. He's the, the chief technical officer, and he's going to be leading the software uh, group. And um, I know that he's real passionate about open source software. So I'm hoping to see, and I'm hoping you all see um, Intel doing a lot more um, in, in open source in the not too distant future. We have like one minute, so if there's a question there that you can quickly answer. Uh, senior management is top priority. Uh, actually, getting you know, get, having legal uh, tell top management that this is a priority is a good thing too. So if you can you can find a, a sympathetic uh, lawyer, I find that managers and executives typically listen to to legal, and I think that was uh, that was a, a really big. Um, uh, secret or you know how Intel's uh, OSPO came to be in the first place was that it was legal said hey you need to do something all right it's 10 well it's 10 a.m. Well, somewhere time but uh, 1 p.m. in Eastern Standard uh, I would like to thank both of you for, for your talk, um, and uh, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Applause for, for our two uh, speakers. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.